so for me, as, as I grew and started CEO, I was able to understand the dynamics and the microcosms of sports and how it relates to real life and how being able to use those frustrating moments as teachable lessons to kids, you know, on if you can do that to stay in the game, right? If you can keep your emotions and your composure enough to be able to stay in this game and not get a tag or not have to get subbed out, then you can do the same thing at work. You can do the same thing in your relationships. Uh, just the pandemic, right? The pandemic really put a, uh, uh, made our children really go through hard times, you know? Uh, I know as adults, we was, we was getting frustrated on how to adapt to the new, the new norm, right? And our kids got hit the hardest, so I just wanted to be bold about, you know, stopping the violence, support uh, survivors of gun violence, because, you know, we live in a city and it, yeah, the gun violence is at an all-time high, but at the same time is, the survivors of gun violence never get the spotlight shine on them. You know, the ones that still gotta deal with their PTSD on a regular basis. So giving them a platform to get embraced by the whole community. It was a way that I could mentorship students, kids in the community, um, basketball, you have basketball, you have football. I'm like, you know what? Everybody can do basketball, football. So what can I bring to the table? Let's try something different. Let's get more physical with, you know, everyday life, um, and it was boxing, and so I kind of like tell all the kids when they, you know, come to a situation, punch it out. Mm, so right. we kind of punch everything out, because I'd rather punch it out than pick up a gun. Welcome everybody to another episode of Sports Talk. Um, today we're I work for Appetite for Change. Um, you are all watching our Table Talk Northside Story Conversations. We have Tommy McBrayer, Jamil Jackson, and Morgan McDonald. Um, today we'll be talking about, you know, sports, youth, and how, you know, you can use sports as an outlet than just, you know, being about playing against somebody or something. You know, it's really uh, deeper than just um, the competition and playing the actual sport. Um, so we have three lovely gentlemen here today um, that started their own programs. Um, Tommy started um, Don't Shoot Guns, Shoot Hoops, Jamil Run and Shoot, and um, CEO Change Equal Opportunities, and Morgan McDonald with um, the Lucy Laning Boxing Academy. So thank you all for showing up today. I really appreciate you all coming and having this conversation with me. Um, just a little background for me. Um, when I told y'all, you know, I just been watching y'all from Facebook, seeing the great work that y'all done. I showed up to a few running shoots. It wasn't my cup of tea, but I did show up to a few um, back in my high school days. Um, Morgan and I did some um, volunteering at Lucy Laney. Um, my cousin used to be on the boxing team, so that's how we met. And then I just watch you on Facebook, and I think y'all are some amazing people. Um, the work y'all are doing is really great, and I think more people need to know about who y'all are and why y'all do the work that y'all do. Um, a lot of times we have great people in our community doing great work, and they always get looked over. So this is an opportunity for y'all to be heard, say who y'all are, and just you know shine a light on some great individuals. Sure. So, um, Tommy, if you just want to tell us a little bit about why you actually started Don't Shoot Guns, Shoot Hoops, um, and then we'll just move around. You let us know why you started um, what you started, and so on and so, so on. Should I look at you as I'm, as I'm I think you I should, should I... just look at all of us. Should I? Oh, don't I look at the camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, uh, well, Don't Shoot Guns, Shoot Hoops was established in uh, November of 2021. You know, it's like the end of the pandemic, well, not the end of the pandemic, but like the middle of the pandemic. Uh, the youth uh, experience uh, park closures, school cancellations, event cancellations. Uh, I just put myself in these kids' shoes. Like I just wouldn't know what, how being growing up as a kid would go if I didn't have parks, if I didn't have graduations, if I didn't look forward to prom and things like that. I probably wouldn't have graduated high school to be honest with you. you know, I just didn't like school that much. If you took away all of that, so then all of a sudden I was like, you know, uh, I felt like it, it needed to be a staple being presented in the, in the city. And it had to be from the 25 to 35 year olds, the 18 to 35 year olds. We need to be lead, like you know, people say you, our youth is our future, but they're looking up to us mm -hmm. right now, you know? So I wanted to, we started the basketball tournament, our first annual uh, March Madness, I mean, November Madness, where we had four teams, 40 players, and it's called Don't Shoot Guns, Shoot Hoops. And it was just like, just wanted to test the water. Just like, you know, sometimes you never know if the city's gonna jump on something that's gonna stop the violence, right? So before you know it, it was a sold out event. And from there, I was like, okay, we need to make this a nonprofit. We own or something. They got a nice buzz to it. And the city was, was supporting it. 
And so after that, we was like, okay, start doing tournaments, three on three, five on five tournaments, just to create safer spaces for you, just to be you, just to just, I, I, we vision just a kid being in the gym, playing, laughing, winning a trophy, right? And at one point you just catch him just laughing or just having fun and, you, and forget about his friend that just passed mm -hmm. away probably a week ago or two weeks ago, just trying to create that, just that environment. And through the uh, through Don't Shoot Guns Crew, we implemented a boys and men camp. Because like you said, being an urban city kid in the city, you don't see a lot of grown men. You don't see a lot of real men, right? If you, if you haven't played the sport, and you know where sports teach you, you know work ethic, discipline, things like that, um, accountability, things like that. So if you don't have that, then you turn into the streets, right? Like I said, you're looking for the streets. You really ain't looking for no real men. So do we implement the boys and men camp five day for five days for a nice where we take them to, to the national sports center in Blaine, take them outside their trauma environment, right? Take them something else where we now we can pour into like how we want to pour into you, take away the distractions, take away TVs, games, cell phones, and implement the right things. Anger management, self-control, learning about meditation, learning about healing, the importance of healing and trauma. And so we just did that, like just like trying to save lives. You know, we're trying to save the youth lives, give them a chance to like live past 40 years old. You know, you know, us in the urban city, we struggling to make it to 40. So trying to create these safe Me spaces too. where we could just be be vulnerable, you know, be be black, be proud, be a kid, you know, just be a kid, you know. So that's where the boys and men came, I mean, uh, don't shoot gun shoot came in there. Yeah. All right, um, Jamil, so okay. I'm just gonna throw this out there. Y'all had like a video back in the days. I'm saying back in the days, like it was that long ago. <laughs> but y'all had made a video about run and shoot mm -hmm. and it was um I don't know, it kind of came on. It, it was to, I liked it because it was to throw people off, you know, it's yeah, called right. run and shoot, and then like how y'all had it come on, but then y'all changed the narrative in the video to people running and shooting hoops. Right. So um, mm -hmm. you just want to explain, that's probably yeah, what, so, why you came up with it, huh? Well, <laughs> no, actually, um, you know, what's crazy is 2008, 2008, I started um, CEO Change Equals Opportunity. Um, it's an after school program for, for young males um, because I was coaching sports at Farview Park. And when I would get in my car to go home with my sons, I would see all these boys having to walk home in the dark with no supervision, no nothing. We're talking about seven, eight year olds, right? And I just, my, my, my manhood, my moral compass wouldn't allow that. So then next week, obviously, I'm taking them all home. The next week, what's happening? They all go on home with me, right? <laughs> and so and then eventually, right, that just became the norm where they're with me 24-7, 365. And so I just became that community dad. Um, fast forward the next year, maybe even that year, um, I became the, the, the assistant head basketball coach at Dunwoody Academy High School. And it was there where it was a new charter school. And so every player was ineligible the first year of basketball because of the Minnesota State High School League transfer rule. So they had played in Maya's tournaments the whole time. So, but we got all the kids to get eligible. So the next year we actually had a full season. So we had a good season. We had JV and, and varsity teams. Our varsity team made it to like the semifinals of sections. Um, you know, so we were doing good. That following year we moved inside North High School. When we moved inside North High School, Minneapolis Public Schools said that we couldn't have two competing high schools in the same building. So they made us cut our sports program. Mm. So then we had all these boys that we didn't just work hard to get eligible and get their grades up and have some accountability and all that thing. And now you're telling us we can't do nothing. So I said, what I'm going to do is as long as y'all keep your grades up and keep doing stuff, I'll keep putting y'all back in the Mayas tournaments. Mm. Well, we were using Fireview Park to play, to practice. And I was doing tournaments, but then as I would show up with my kids from Dunwoody, then all the other kids from Edison and Henry and all that, we dog y'all and all this, and coach let us scrimmage y'all, right? And so then it became, well, all right, when we're done with conditioning, y'all can come back and scrimmage us, right? But then they would be like, well, we don't want to leave. Can we condition you with you? So 10 kids turned to 30 kids, turned to 50 kids, and I'm like, okay, what am I going to do with this? I'm going to create an in house league. Right, and this is when AAU was starting to spark, but it was very expensive. There wasn't a lot of teams in North Minneapolis, right? So our kids didn't have access to go out and play competitive basketball with jerseys and you know uniforms and that type of stuff. So then I just I 
I took some money and I put it together and, you know, 13 years and 30 seasons later, you know, here we are <laughs> still can, continuing to do it. And so um, my why, though, had nothing to do with basketball. The reality is that I knew that every kid on my Dunwoody team wasn't going to college for basketball, right? But if I can use basketball as the carrot to expose them to all of the career fields that are associated with sports, right? So they can understand and see that and then even add the community aspect to that, add the violence to that. Because what we see is we see a lot of our former athletes that are then hitting the streets, picking up guns, right? Because they're not being exposed to other avenues with inside the sport. And so when that physical ability is gone, then their name still has to be prideful somewhere, right? If you're a superstar in seventh grade and eighth grade football, and now all of a sudden you go to high school, but you haven't been taught the discipline of the game, right? Now that high school coach is benching you, and now are you gonna have the, right, the, the manhood to stand up and fight through and get your spot back or to learn the skill sets, or are you gonna quit? But again, you still need that name to ring, so, because that's all you know. But again, if we can expose them to these cameras, if we can expose them to broadcasting, if we can, and this is all sports, not just basketball, right? If we can expose them to scouting, all those things, then the likelihood of them giving up on themselves becomes less and less because, okay, I can't play the basketball no more, but now I can organize basketball tournaments, yep. right? And I can still be with all the great basketball players and they can all still shake my hand and be my friend and, and be a part of it, right? Like, and we're, we, we just have to do, so that, that was my why, um, is I wanted to expose them to college career and culture experiences outside of this because for me, even myself, I thought that when I was in high school and basketball was taken away from me, that was the only way I can go to college. And so then it became F school, right? I, what am I going to school for if I can't continue to play the sport that I love? But if I had an understanding about coaching and all those other tracks, then, right? I know I got a brilliant mind. I just didn't know how to access that. Hey, well, thank y'all. Um, Morgan, good. before I have you go, I just wanted to touch on something that you just talked about because mm -hmm. we have a youth program here um, as well. We started with 14 to 24 year olds and realized, you know, it was kind of a disconnect having a 14 year old in the same room as a 24 year old. So we changed our model to be 14 to 17. Um, and what you just said is what I've been telling them all the time. You know, you might think that you want to be a football player, basketball player, but let's think about everything else that goes into that. Or you might want to be a rapper. Let's think about, you know, being yeah. a producer, manager, you know, opening up. Um, the door for them to not only just think, oh, this the only way out. If that way don't work, you got three more doors mm -hmm. open. So I'm mm -hmm. glad that you said that. Um, Morgan, you want to tell us what you do and why? Well, uh, student support specialist at Lucy Laney, but the boxing, um, I did every sport, and it was a it was a way to be a mentor. So I did uh, football over at Creekview. I, I coached with Coach Chris. We did a lot of winning, and um, I did basketball. We, you know, we, we had a lot of success with that. And um, for me, it was like, what else could I use a as a carrot, you know what I'm saying, to get them off the streets, to keep them on this side of the fence? What can I use? OK, cool. I did open gym basketball, but you know, I'm, I'm not boxing. So you know, I, you know I, I was doing a little boxing, and then in the way that I wanted to do it, I just did it on my own. Uh, I, had, I, had a great, I had a great person tell me, don't tell me, just do it. And I did it. And, uh, I've been doing it ever since. So 32 national championships later, um, I was able to just create something and take kids and use my imagination and take them on trips, uh, you know, out of the city. Like uh, I started, uh, founded in, uh, what was it? Uh, 19, 2019. And then we just, we kept growing. It started off with just my kids and um, with, with the boxing and the discipline that I sh showed them. And, and they display all the kids wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, we want to do that. Mm -hmm. Hey, can we come with y'all? Mm -hmm. Hey, can we do that? And they start seeing more and more. Then they start traveling with us. Then they start being at my house. And you know, uh, yeah, my house. Oh. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Groceries. Oh my God. But yeah, um, it, it's been a, it's been a way to try to keep them on this side of the fence and being able to mentor them. So, me being a student support specialist, they see Mr. McDonald. But then after that, they see Coach McDonald. Then they see Dad McDonald. Yeah. So it's like, damn. Then they see yes. Uncle McDonald. They see Big Brother uh -huh. McDonald. It's like, mm -hmm. you got all this, and then you could talk to this person. You respected by this person. But I'm like, in the end of the day, I was y'all. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I was y'all. So I'm just being the person, my wife. 
I'm just being the person that I needed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Cool, you know, I can dress, shoes, but at the same time, serious, what's next? Yeah. Okay, cool, what's next? What we doing next? We achieving this goal. So as far as like um, life skill is, the boxing is definitely a life skill because it's a lonely sport. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I tell them, so if everybody can't run a three miles on the same time, and if they do, they cheating. Right. And if they do, they, you know, it, it, the measurement is different. So as far as like um, the push, the willpower, right. uh, just the grind, just you, you, can, you, can go through, you can go through anything. You can achieve any goal you want to. And, and every day we, we, we try to maximize that. And um, quiet is kept, like the girls on my team, they the bomb, right. you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, the boys, right. they know boxing for, 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 for boys. And you know, but I got some girls that's, they nice yeah. in the country, you know what I mean? So um, I'm, 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 I'm glad that I, I'm able to mentor the fellas and I'm able to mentor young ladies. You know what I mean? I'm not a woman, but I know how to treat a woman. So as right. far as them to see this and me to practice on my babies and you know what I mean? It, 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 it's dope as far as mentoring them and, and keeping them inside the fence. It's hard, it's hard. I, like play, I play basketball my wife, but boxing was one of my, my favorite sport. Oh, like, I, I can't get enough of it, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so y'all, uh, y'all like saying the same stuff, I love it. Um, but a lot of y'all mentioned, well, feel y'all um, like, being that person that you needed or um, being that person just for yourself. Um, if y'all could give y'all 14, 15 year old self some advice. So if you were talking to mm -hmm. your 14, if I'm your 14, 15 year old self, yeah. what would you say to yourself? I'll give y'all some time to think if y'all don't know. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, look, yeah, yeah, I could do it right, go ahead. And it's okay if y'all shared a little tears. We had a few people cry up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What would I say to myself? Um, that life is long. Um, I think one of the most impactful statements that I think that I could say to myself at that time would probably be, every CEO is a hustler and every hustler is a CEO. Because mm. um, that would give me perspective um, on the direction that I was going in my life. Um, and that you are the man that you believe you are. Some great yeah. advice. That's rip right there, man. You got, you got me. Um, <laughs> uh, I would say being a kid at 15 years old that it's okay to cry. It's okay to, you know, be sad. You know, I, I say like, you know, it's okay to express your feelings. I would say that, um, um, man, that, that, um, <laughs> oh, man, um, I would, I would say that, I would say that, I mean, that little part, you know, and, but I would say, like, I wish I would have read, like, the four agreements younger, you know, like, not learn how to take things personally, like, right, that's when the four agreements don't take things personally. I think you go through an age where you do take things yeah, personally, yeah. right? Like, it, learn, learn how to deal with a bully or something like that. Knowing, like, don't take things personally. This person dealing with something, you know, what he's saying ain't true, you know, things like that. So I would say something like that on that line of it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to, it's okay to cry. It's okay to, you know, express your feelings. So, yeah, express yourself. Ooh. Mm -hmm. I think about this all the time because mm -hmm. my, my son kind of looks just like Man. me. So. <laughs> I'm really talking to him, but talking to myself mm. at the same time. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Um, but keep going, perseverance. Um, you are who you say you are. Mm. Um, it don't matter what nobody think about you. Just keep going. Um, I'm gonna say financial literacy. Mm. I'm gonna say definitely look into that. I'm gonna say look into credit. I'm gonna look, say look into savings. Um, mm. I'm, I'm gonna say maximize every time that you can get learning. Read as much as you can, uh, but don't stop. Keep yeah. going. Yeah. It is that that other side of, of life is it, there. Just keep going. All right. Um, I'm kind of asking the same question. You know, I just want to know because doing this work, I'm only 25. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working with you since I was 14, wow. um, and for me, it's hard. Um, for like these past 11 years, you know, working with you, seeing them come in and out. So for y'all, I'm pretty sure the work is hard, but like what, what keeps y'all 
like, all right, get up, roll mm -hmm. over, I'm gonna do this again. <laughs> go to sleep, roll over, I'm gonna get up and go do it again. Like, I think, go ahead. I think, I think it comes down to your why at the same time. You know, like, I be ha I, like recently, I've been having a lot of reality checks, right? And my reality checks is, I find myself alone a lot, right? Like you said, you a public figure, we know a lot of people. But reality is my friends are dead or in jail. A lot of them, like probably 35 friends that's either, you know, lost themselves from drugs, guns, or in jail. So it's that I got to keep on pushing this message around gun violence because I got so many friends that lost their life from gun violence that I got to keep, until like it's, it's time to clock out, I got to keep on pushing because I don't want it to lose any more friends from gun violence. Uh, so that's what, that's what keeps me going. And then at the same time, it's the mentors like Jamil, it's the other mentors that, that's older than me that's starting to recognize what you're going and say, hey, brother, you know you're saving lives. You know, when they tell you out their mouth that you're saving lives, then that's a whole nother thing. Now, I, I, couldn't say, I couldn't say that out my mouth, right? Like, oh, yeah, we saving lives. But when they say, like, hey, brother, hope you know you're saving lives, I'm like, dang, like, okay. So it gets that motivation. Like, okay, we got to keep on doing what we're doing, you know? So that's for me, yeah. Um, my why? Oh, man, that's a deep question. Um, we're parentless, me and my siblings are from the age of me being 15, 15 and a half, um, which means we, dad was gone, mom was gone, we had a house, it was on Section 8, so Section 8 paid the rent, so we were able to, to maintain. Um, we were savvy enough to understand how to keep the lights on during the winter with the cold weather rule, but every summer, <laughs> right, we live with candlelight, we live with no water, we live with, you know, no, no, no electricity, um, but we have brotherhood. We had each other and my little brother and all of his friends, our house became the safe haven, as messed up as it was inside those walls was our world that we got to control. But in that, being the elder of everybody, I had the responsibility of keeping everybody safe and everybody right out of trouble. And so back then is when MYS, MYS had just started. And so tournaments, and it wasn't called AAU at the time, it was called Metro Basketball, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it had just started like my freshman year of high school and so this was the first time you would play against kids from Edina and kids from Shakopee and all that. So they didn't care who was paying, getting in these tournaments, right? So I, at 16, was using my street money to pay for me and my brothers to play in tournaments. So we would all pack up in our two cars. We'd be smoking on the way there. <laughs> High as all kites getting out the car. I mean, Cheech and Chong opening the doors, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we go play basketball, and then we go back home. But that was our role. Every weekend, we knew we was in a tournament. And we hustle up enough money to get in this tournament this weekend. Win, lose, or draw, we was together. And so for me, that brotherhood was a sense of what I wanted to create out of sport. Um, my other why was <clears throat> because of that, that lifestyle of not having any parents, I had to hit the streets. I was the oldest, so I kind of had to maintain and take the lead and provide for my family. And so when I was 26, um, I was arrested and charged with three felonies, 10 to 31 years apiece. Mm -hmm. um, after, after being able to navigate through that case, uh, the state of Nevada, picked it up and indicted me with the RICO. And so then I was facing the 25 years with no possibility of parole. For whatever reason, um, God saw something in me and allowed that judge and used that judge as a vessel to tell me that I had something better for my life than with the road I was traveling. And he gave me probation. Hmm. And to date, as we sit here today, I would still have about six years left on that 25 year sentence. I got to see my kids grow up. I got to experience life. I got to write. And so for me, like my why is different. Like my why isn't attached to a legacy, isn't attached to money or right, ego, any of that. Like to be able to hear kids in their story and be able to share mine for the way they look up to me. I mean, you know, even you, right? Even you, the way that you guys receive me, like I have an obligation to keep going and to keep walking 
in this in these steps in this path regardless of what i want to do yeah. right yeah. like my obligation is bigger than that <laughs> i mean right like <laughs> men behind the camera and and my relationships with them and these young men and women who are watching us and the relationships now that we're going to have because they hear this story and they see us hanging out this way like we serve a purpose yeah. and as black men in our community our purpose is greater than us right to whom much is given much is required and because of my experiences and all the black men who had had to go to prison and spend time behind bars and not be with their babies and their daughters is out here with no father figure and their sons is out here right with no dad and they didn't do half of the shit that i did yeah. right to be in that position like i'm obligated so to me when that judge said three years probation that's not what i heard what i heard was you're obligated and I came back and hit the ground running and I ain't looked up ever since, right? And so now I take CEO. And so then it was, I read a book called Ink Yourself, I-N-C Yourself. And this book teaches you, and this was right after my case. So in 2006, 2007, before I started teaching, before any of that popped off for me, this book taught you how to take your name, burn your credit up, then take your name, and incorporate yourself, your own personal name. And now when you apply for credit, you don't use your social security number, you use your tax ID number. And I was just blown away because again, I had all this money, right? I could live the lifestyle that I want, but I didn't really own nothing, right? I had no assets, I had all liabilities, right? And so you talk about financial literacy when you're talking about what you would tell your young self, right? And so like, again, so now every adult in my world I was pissed at. <laughs> because you saw me oh doing God. all this oh nonsense, God. right? And you didn't smack me upside the head. You just celebrated me in it, right? And so it was like, nah, I'm not going to be that. So I'm going to hold every kid accountable. I'm going to make sure that they understand the true value of their self, right? The, to, the true worth of their, their work ethic, right? Because that was my true financial freedom is me, right? And so now what I teach my kids is, I'm the dope they want to smoke. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be the best that I can be at everything that I do so that I'm the one they want, baby, right? And so once you get, like, and once you have that mindset, right, like a C, every CEO is a hustler, every hustler is a CEO. You just got to understand the product that you're selling. Come on. Come on. And then once you realize you're selling yourself, like I say, CEO doesn't just stand for changing this opportunity. You are the CEO of you. How you show up dictates the doors that are open and the opportunities that are presented to you. And opportunity doesn't come once in a lifetime like we were told back in the day. Opportunity presents itself every second. And do you have the information and the knowledge to understand that it's right in front of your face? And once our kids can understand that at this age, right, then we're moving something. But until we start using sport, right, as a way to, to conversate and use our intellect because again, what she has to do to become a national champion, what she has to use in her genius to be able to understand when and when not to, right, is the same genius it takes to do anything in life. But we're only showing it to them in this one context. Right, and that's why that change, that change equal opportunity. That's real, right. you have to change. To, yo, yo, whatever behavior you are, you have to change it to get to that opportunity, absolutely. man. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, that's big, man. Uh, my term is experience is everything. Right. Experience is everything. Right. So right. the torch that my mentors gave me, the torch that the situation I was brought up in gave me, I'm obligated. You know what I'm saying? I'm right. obligated to be my mentor, who he was for me, as far as telling me, putting me on to game. And then, like, now, being 39, but, you know, small so they can feel like they, the kids feel like they can, they can talk to me, they can relate to me, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? So I, I, I like that, you know what I mean? That's cool, you know what I mean? So like as far as the experience though, the experience is everything as far as like everything I've been through in my Absolutely. life. Absolutely. It was a 360, like every idea I had in college, growing up, the life's been, everything now. Mm -hmm. I'm look, I can mm -hmm. see the plate. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just mm -hmm. organizing it. Like, mm -hmm. okay, this was for this. Mm -hmm. I can apply that, this mm -hmm. for this. And so just trying to teach the kids every day, like, you got, I got some tough kids that's been through some stuff right now. Mm -hmm. And 
them the ones I really kind of put my arm around, like, nah, you can't quit because you got something in you. You here right now, wait till you, wait till next year. Right, I promise right. You. Wait till next right. month. It's going to get everything get better. But you got something in you that's like a, a diamond in the rough, right. a rose out of right. concrete. Right. It don't happen all the time, but you got the skills to grow. And, and so, like, just having that torch and being able to, uh, teach and talk and show the kids and be a role model and, and just keep going. Yes, getting up every day, but then I got a son. I got a son that, that's got to see, like, that's the man I look at. Not the, you know, you know I like Lil Wayne, but not the Lil right, Wayne, you right, know what I'm right, saying? Right. My dad dope. My right, dad really is right, dope. Yeah, like, right, you know what I'm saying? My right. dad dope. Uh, a lot of the kids don't have fathers around them. Mr. McDonald right there, I got you, you know that. Right. And got uncles, big brothers, I'm gonna talk to you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna treat you like you mine. Every kid know that, every parent, and Lucien Laney know that. I think you know that. I think, uh, I, I, I think <laughs> y'all know that, you know what I mean? But I, I don't know how to do it like a business. I just know how, what was put in me, I know how to project yeah. that. Right. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. I know how to project right. that. Right. I know it's a right. way to do it, but I know how to talk to my people. I know how to talk to my babies. I know how to talk to the past me. <clears throat> You know, or the future me. I know how to do that. I can do that easy. That's easy. So just knowing that I got a son, I got a daughter, I got nephews, I got mentees that all look the, up to me. The community. The community. Man. You like, know what I mean? It's, it's our ecosystem, and that's where I just, it, it's just, they be all the belong to us, they gotta, right? Like, you gotta be the from light. the schools to the parks, it's like, they're our responsibility, and it's our responsibility to hold everybody who touches our babies accountable. Right to how they touch our babies. Yep, and I think one thing that I just grab onto is like the importance of giving back to the same neighborhood you grew up in, same community you grew up in. Because you see a lot of people like they make it, right? They they make it in the league, and you know they make it being a rapper or whatever it is, and not a lot of them come back, you know. Mm -hmm. And when they come back, they they they're on a high horse. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm better than these, you know. Whoop, whoop, or you almost want to turn your back. Oh, these some bad kids. Like knowing you were just one of the bad kids, you know. You know that's the thing. Like, hey, man, I was y'all. I talked y'all. Like, so what's your name? No, on your name tag. Put your nickname. You want me to call your nickname? Put whatever you want me to call. You know, cause I'm gonna add to that though, right? Because I think this is where we we lose out mm -hmm. as a community. What do you guys think the percentage of in America of people that make over one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year? Oof. What do you over? think? Over. Over that, over. Over. Oh. Yeah, I'm going Seven percent. Oh, Seven? Like Seven percent, like right. Seven yeah, percent, <laughs> right. And so my thing, though, is that only 7% make over 150. So in reality, we're striving up here looking for the superstars that ain't showing up, mm -hmm. and we ain't holding these people that are here Pulling accountable to show, because there's more, way, way more, more of them yeah. than they are of the one or two rappers or you know entertainers that from our community that make it out that should be responsible to give back, right. right? Like, I don't, I don't know, man. We like even through sports, like no, no, no organization within our community that's doing right by our kids should be struggling financially oh in the sense that None. there's enough of us within community who need a Morgan McDonald for our children, right? Or a don't shoot gun, shoot hoops, right? Or a run and shoot because they all serve their own individually and collective purpose, right? In the ecosystem. But if we're not supporting each other, first and foremost, right? Like, level. listen, I, we need the money, right? And and I'm on camera, so I'm making sure that, that we, we say this correctly, right? We definitely need the money, but I've never received a grant for run and shoot, right? Or for the trips that I take with kids. Like, that's all out of pocket. So I get it, which is why every time I see you, right, I'm asking you, let yeah, me know what you yeah. need, and, and we're going to figure it out because it's a community. Think about this. If there's one, two, three, four, five black men in this room now, we all know 10 black men, right? That's a duh, right? Now, we're all in a, a pretty stable financial situation as black men. We all know 10 other black men that are in a pretty stable financial situation. That's 50 black men, right? They all know 10, that's 100, right? They can all give $50 a month, a month to the cause. How much money do you need for nationals right now? <laughs> All right, so I found the hotel for like six fifty for the week. We talking gas, food for mm -hmm, all of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Twenty five. 
Hundred. Twenty five hundred, I think. Twenty five hundred. This man, like, this right. man is standing right. on this corner with his time, mm. outside of the time that he's already given, mm. right? From his family, from his children, from himself, from his own financial desires, right? For the ecosystem, and then the ecosystem can't produce twenty five hundred dollars so that he can go home and rest because he's about to do all the work when he gets there. Come on, now. come on, come on, Mike. It, that's our problem, right? Um, and, and, but, but, but the other side of that, though, is that how many people celebrate the wins, right? But aren't there for the, 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 the yeah. struggle, yeah. right? Yeah. That, are, that aren't willing to be there for those pieces. And, and I don't mean it in a bad way to say that, we're not, that I, I'm knocking our people because they're celebrating the wins. I'm saying celebrate the whole process. Be there, be yeah, present, yeah, yeah. right? Allow, a, a support this man. Like somebody else could be doing this part, yeah. right? While he's doing that, there's somebody out. And, and just because we're so, we're, we've been forced to fight over the few dollars that do come into our community yeah. as it relates to sports or any programming mm -hmm. for that matter, right? Instead of coming together as a full collective, yeah. right? Imagine if we had one Minneapolis where, and I'm just throwing that yeah. term yeah, out yeah, there yeah, for yeah. sure, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was boxing underneath that mm -hmm. and karate underneath yeah. that and archery underneath that and lacrosse underneath that right and we could collectively then branch out and you're responsible for this part and you're responsible for that part then our babies get the holisticness yeah, of yeah. community in the yeah. ecosystem yeah. that they need right yeah. and so the money's here mm -hmm. we can do the work we just have to come together to do the work and i'm i'm grateful to you for even you know bringing this together to where we can start talking to other grassroots individuals you know and collectively figure out how we we make that happen. And, I, and, and man, and sorry, I gotta pick you back, <laughs> but I gotta pick you back on you because it's like, yeah, you're right. It's like the collaborative. It's the, but some people get so big head they don't want to seek for help, right? And then, like I said, it's like what I'm dealing with now, being 33 years old, is you got those people that don't want to move in their position. They don't want to. They don't want to invest in the younger. They want to be that person that's 65 is still in charge of the whole organization. It's like, come on, you gotta invest in some younger some younger blood to keep that cycle going, right? And I think I just seen somebody step down that that was on like the Minnesota Minneapolis Council or something like that, that stepped down because she like, I need to make room for other, yeah, for yeah. another opportunity, you know? So yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's, that's important like that we create, keep on creating that will of grab somebody else to pull in, right? So we can dish out different tasks. Like, okay, now y'all do this, you do this, right? And you just manage it, right? And you give out the dish out the tasks before you know it, you done moved up. They done moved into your position. So, having that system that we can keep on. Well, right, but I just want to challenge you on that, right? Because I think that's part of the problem, mm -hmm. is that we, we, we look at life through a pyramid, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And as you go up, the spots get smaller, and so now you're saying that she has to move out the way for someone else to come, and even her, and I'm not mad at her, her yeah. thought process b b b behind that, but I even challenge that, right? Mm -hmm. Why can't there be two? Mm -hmm. Why can't there be six? Right? Like, why can't we, well, why can't we corner the market? Why can't we, you know, have this over here and this over there? And why aren't we planting seeds? And I was just coming from a, a, a meeting before this where we were having that conversation where, again, I'm philosophy of village, right? Of we create what we need, right? We don't, we don't let them create just what they want to be. I mean, they're geniuses, don't get me wrong, but their minds are wild, Absolutely. right? They want to be, yeah, right? And again, but if all of them want to go be a basketball player, and we know that one of them is going to make it, then what are we doing to the other six by not having that mindset and that understanding already? And not saying that we take the dream away mm -hmm. by far, yeah. but then we have to be intentional about exposing to those other areas, right, that you can too be this right and live a successful life because back to it only seven percent of our country is making over 150,000 so that kind of puts you in a unique yeah. class right and so yeah. I when I speak to the Timberwolves I tell them that when you call me and ask me if I want to buy tickets right <laughs> you want to put some dumb show behind it yeah. right and then reality you're giving when you give me the tickets you're giving me these tickets up here Nosebleeds. right nosebleeds yeah. And so then my kids go up those stairs, go back down, go but hold on though, the only faces they can see are those in the front row, right? But all of your season ticket holders are here, right? And they're not superstars, right? 
they're regular every Joe Schmo people who are just working a regular job making that 7%, right? And can afford to come here and enjoy, but what jobs do they do? What are their careers? That's what they gotta be exposed to. Absolutely. Yeah. I like, well, that's, I like a, that's where your mentor, man. That's where you could go, man. I like how LeBron did it with his, with his partners. Yeah, absolutely. Like, they, they all know, like, all right, we all can't be LeBron. LeBron, you got that. That's what look, I'm saying. Look, check it. You got that's, that. Yeah. That's you. Okay, cool. That's right? what you want I'm that, saying. Doing your thing. Right. We here. And so it's a whole right. ship. It's a whole right. ship. I like, I like LeBron ship. <laughs> Right. I love LeBron. We need more LeBron. LeBron. Right. And he was, but he was humble enough to allow them to lead in their in in their respectful areas. Right. Mm -hmm. It didn't have to be the LeBron show. Absolutely. Um, Round and it all and it all right and it all played out the way they were supposed to play out. But I mean, sports is a microcosm of life, like we all said. Um, it's just how do we how do we get our community to be on one accord and to, to be able to use the sport for what we need it for, for our youth and our community, as opposed to what it's being used for today, mm -hmm. right? Because again, as a head basketball coach at Henry, I have too many kids that want to be a varsity basketball player, but don't have the varsity basketball player work ethic or skill set, mm -hmm. right? And it's unfair to that kid that busts his ass and come to, to workouts and two a days and all that for me then to have to sit you next to him when you're just doing it for the fun of it, mm -hmm. right? But you're only doing it for the fun of it because we're not providing fun in no other areas, mm -hmm. right? And if we showed you that this was fun, yeah. right? And gave you some opportunities to create your own mm -hmm. and be creative, guess what? Yeah. He probably wouldn't go through my two a days. Yeah. He probably wouldn't go through throwing up, you know, at 6 a.m. in the morning before school started if he knew that I could just be the cameraman for the basketball team, mm. right? Yeah, or I could right. be the statistician, yeah. right? Or I could be this. And so we as community have to do a better job at the young age of even, like, do you have a statistician? No. Right? You should, right? Do you have a statistician, right? Every college sport has a scholarship for a statistician. Mm. So our kids, University of North Carolina, they just did an article on her. She's doing her undergrad. I mean, I'm sorry, her master's program, getting paid for. She's the statistician for the basketball team. Hmm. All right, so we got about four minutes before we wrap it up. I, no, I just want to say thank y'all. Um, information is really great, but I do got one last question. And it was, um, did you see yourself doing this? Or where did you, see, like, did you say, like for me, I'm just, I'm a, I want to be a police officer. And I've been saying this since I've probably been two. Mm -hmm. um, but the more I've been going through life, I've been realizing that maybe that's not for me. Yeah. Maybe what I'm doing is what I'm supposed to be doing. So what did you all want to be when you were about hmm, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Oh, wow, man, that kind of cliche of being an NBA player. You know, I thought I was, I thought, but I, I mean, I was a good athlete. Um, and so I, I just thought that was my track. And so then when that didn't happen, I was lost. Um, I was in the streets for a while, hustling, you know, and not knowing what I was going to, even through that, not knowing what my next thing was going to be or who was going to be. It was when I got into coaching, yeah. right? And that love of that aha moment, right? Of not knowing when it's going to come, that car ride when that kid finally wakes up, mm -hmm. right? And says something to you that you've been, in his ear for the last three years, right? Yeah, yeah. Finally, just some, and he, he doesn't even say it directly, <laughs> but something makes sense and you, you get that sense of peace. But from like every morning I wake up to tons of messages, you know, coach this and how do I do this? And again, that gives me the motivation because there's, because I'm needed, yeah. right? So that fulfills that cup. But then also the coach, I did this, I accomplished that. I got my GED, I got this job, right? And so that makes me feel good because I'm a part of the ecosystem and they feel good telling me. So for me, man, I don't work. Yeah. Like every day, like I, I really get to live life. I'm, I'm taking 18 kids to Florida mm -hmm. next week, right? And we're going to, we're on a yacht and we got jet skis and like, it, right. And yeah. so to, again, just to watch their moments and to see them looking out, piercing out the window of, 
of the airplane because they've never been on one, right? Or the fearness of getting on the back of a jet ski, knowing we're going to tip them over when we hit <laughs> 300 yards out there, right? But just like those, so I, like, um, I, I, I honestly couldn't see myself doing anything else. I would say, I mean, even as a kid, like I said, I wanted to be a basketball player. Couldn't keep a basketball out my, out my hand. Um, but even like 15 years ago, I see myself being where I'm at now. You know, 15 years ago is where my story started at. I was tied up, shot, left for dead in the hallway at 20 years old. So I say 15 years because they say, oh, 15 years ago I was in high school. You know, and he was a senior and they say, well, you see yourself in 10 to 15 mm -hmm. years. And in 10 to 15 years, I done got shot three times, things like that. But at the end, I'm a CEO and founder of my own nonprofit. So did I see this? No, I didn't. You know, there's a lot of things I feel like could have went the other way. You know, even like you said, getting shot and not healing correctly, looking for, seeking for revenge of this street code for, you know, I'd be dead or in jail of just not being the healing right. So no, I didn't see myself being a CEO of don't shoot guns, shoot hoops. And sure, sometimes you didn't see yourself live. You know, um, you know, 15 years down the line, you know, so, yeah, so it's a blessing. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> my mom dealt with drugs hard, so when I went to college, I just wanted to help out adults who had kids to not put on their kids how I felt mm -hmm. seeing my mom on drugs. So then when I went to college, it was like, help the adult out? Nah, I want to help the kids out. I want to help little Morgan out. I want to help Morgan out. He's in that room crying. Right. We knew what mom right, was doing right, in the other room. Right, you know what I right, mean? So right. I didn't see myself quite, but I saw myself. Mm. I knew I was going to be helping kids. Um, I did not. I really didn't know that, but I did know that based on how my mom was, based out, based on how I found out my uncles on my mom's side that I never met, mm. same exact way. Mm. I'm like, okay, all right. And then, and then find out like three months ago, my dad did boxing. Mm, you know what I mean? Clip, right? What? <laughs> I'm like, he did boxing. Get out of here. Stop playing me. So to find out he did boxing, to know I'm in doing boxing, you know, at, at a high level, like, um, no, I didn't see myself doing it, but I knew I was going to be helping. Helping some way. If it wasn't a parent who was doing the drugs, it was a kid thinking about his mom doing the drugs or who missing because they strung out in the car from drugs or, you know, yeah. something like that. I knew I was going to be helping kids, though. Okay, well, um, thank you all again for coming, sitting at this table, um, being open, being vulnerable, sharing stories that people may not have heard, sharing them with me, you know. We want to thank um, you, man. We want to thank you for you setting know. it up. You You're know? welcome. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I really appreciated y'all time here. Thank y'all for making a little quick salad with me. Um, I hope this is not the last time that we at Appetite for Change get to see y'all faces. I snuck a little flyer in y'all bag. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Inviting y'all out to our farmer's market and our community cooking event so y'all can get a real feel of um, what we do. So, again, thank you all, and I hope you have a great evening. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.